Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well and I wanted to thank you for being here. Uh, I have my tea at the ready today. I'm trying out, um, oh my goodness, the My Abysmal French, which is at zero. Uh, it's, it's a tea company called Mayashre. I'm trying out their new flavor, new to me flavor, Wedding Imperial. The room smells of chocolate, so I will not be complaining. Today, I wanted to chat with you about a book that I adore. It's called Secondhand Time, The Last of the Soviets. It's an oral history by Svetlana Alexievich, who is a journalist from Belarus. And I'll start with my elevator pitch. This is somewhat of a long elevator pitch, so let's just pretend we're going 200 floors up. Uh, without judgment and absent criticism or commentary, a journalist invites us to learn about history from below, to listen to the very human, very raw voices of the people who experienced firsthand the Soviet Union and its breakdown. Who they used to be before the collapse of the Soviet Union, who they are now, how they coped with state-sanctioned illusions and dashed hopes, how they may have held on to a meek nostalgia for a past that made their lives. And I personally viewed this book as having the undertones of tragedy and disillusionment and the sense of having to cope with a reality that is completely foreign. It's like, imagine if you spent your entire lifetime or even your childhood or adolescence, uh, however way you spent it, and then almost overnight you are told that your entire identity is no longer valid that your way of thinking, your mindset, your beliefs, your the foundation of who you are as a person is all of that no longer legitimate. It's like culture shock and the generational rift between parents and children, uh, a lost love, heartache, and an entire worldview of what money and success, all of that compressed and toppled into one big mess. And that's what we, these people went through, and that's what we unfortunately overlook when we study about this period of history. Uh, I've spent so much time of my own personal academic background uh, studying foreign policy and immersing myself in U.S.-Russia relations and uh, taking fancy coursework, doing research and writing, and not once did I encounter this kind of history and storytelling that takes into account people's hearts and minds and their dispositions against a backdrop of colossal historical events and movements and their demise. Timothy Snyder has a great write-up on the book and I'll link his article below, but I believe he likened the book to a literature of fact, which I think is a term that he borrowed from the Polish language. English. I don't recall the exact term, but I think it's such an apt way of describing what this book is and what it what reading it entails. I discovered the book from a colleague at the Brennan Center who was reading it and recommended it, and I loved how erudite and down-to-earth and uh, charismatic he is, so it was my mission to emulate him and read everything that he was reading. So I hopped on over to the bookstore that very day after work and grabbed a copy. I don't recall why it took me so long to actually get to reading it, but I am so glad and grateful that I did because this is truly a gem. And uh, today I wanted to pinpoint a few things that made me really appreciate the power of storytelling and personal narrative and personal, not collective, memory. Uh, the first one being books. The passages in secondhand time are just revelatory. Most of them are like gold mines for reading and the written word and books. And in a nutshell, the Soviets breathed in and exhaled literature. <laughs> I mean, I just, I wanted to capture uh, for you the high currency that books held in the Soviet home and how 
all of that, like the financial crash of the 90s came crashing down for these people. There's a passage, for instance, that reads, could you imagine my mother sitting down and embroidering something or going out of her way to decorate our house with porcelain vases or little elephant figurines? Never. That would be a pointless waste of time. Petite bourgeois nonsense. The most important thing is spiritual labor, books. You can wear the same suit for 20 years. Two coats are enough to last you a lifetime, but you can't live without Pushkin or the complete works of Gorky. You're part of the grand scheme of things. And then there's another one that I just can't, just required so much digesting, particularly toward the end. It reads, quote, in reality for me, I am just a twit. Freedom of speech would have been enough for me because a suit, as it soon turned out, at heart, I'm a Soviet girl. Everything Soviet went deeper in us than we'd ever imagined. All I really wanted was for them to let me read Davlatov and Nigrasov and listen to Galich. That would have been enough for me. I would, didn't even dream of going to Paris and strolling through Montmartre or seeing Gaudi's Sagrada Familia. Just let us read and talk. Read. Our little Olga got sick. She was just four months old. In the hospital, I kept pacing and pacing with her back and forth through the corridors. And if I managed to get her to sleep for even half an hour, what do you think I would do? Even though I was beyond exhausted, yes, I always had Solzhenitsyn under my arm. And I would immediately open it and start reading. In one arm, my baby is dying. And with my free hand, I'm holding Solzhenitsyn. Books replaced life for us. They were our whole world. And this is just pervasive throughout the text. But then you also get this creeping sense of disillusionment. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union came with immense economic upheaval. The ruble became nil. People's money in the banks vanished. Like so many families, my newlywed parents found themselves uh, having to pawn off their belongings, like their engagement rings. Uh, cool side story. My dad, way later after the financial crash, um, he glanced over at a pawn shop window and lo and behold, my mom's ring was there and he bought it back. He bought back his own ring. Anyways, the disillusionment. There were so many passages capturing this, uh, this haunting sense of disillusionment. For instance, one observed, quote, There were new rules. If you have money, you count. No money, you're nothing. Who cares if you read all of Hegel? And another one, People had grown poor. This is page 28, 29. People had grown poor, of course, but it wasn't just for the spare cash. Ultimately, books had disappointed them. People were disillusioned. It became rude to ask, what are you reading? Too much about our lives had changed, and these weren't things that you could read about in books. Russian novels don't teach you how to become successful, how to get rich. Oblomov lies on his couch. Chekhov's protagonists drink tea and complain about their lives. And further down below... My father would chase me around the house with his belt, screaming, you profiteer. I spilled blood defending Moscow only to raise a little shithead. Yesterday, it was crime. Today, it's business. I think this was in reference to being a businessman with your run-of-the-mill black market goods. I was particularly struck by the dissonance in the voices of people. So you have, for instance... This idea of a generational rift, and, and that particularly captured my attention. There's a quote that reads, The young who will never understand their parents because they didn't spend a single day of their life in the Soviet Union. My mother, my son, me. We all live in different countries, even though they're all Russia. This book also comes with a personal dose of interest to me because my grandma was born in Smolensk, Russia and, remem and remembers in the mornings running off to grab chocolate and candy wrappers from the Germans during occupation. Uh, her father was declared missing in action after he reported to the front and to this day we have no idea what happened to him. My other great-grandpa also fought in World War II and reached Berlin and won medals. His side comes with stories 
but I'm left wondering what, what each of them would have thought about the post-war period and the political and economic collapse of the 90s. And quotes like this one that I'm about to read sometimes just really capture what perhaps they may have felt. So this whole reading experience came with a personal touch that I found really interesting. The passage reads, Everyone is terribly lonely. Life has completely transformed. The world is divided now between two categories. No longer white and red are those who did time and the ones who threw them in jail, those who've read Solzhenitsyn and those who haven't. Now it's just the haves and the have-nots. And I'm just, it, I've, and I just kept finding myself so intrigued by how intriguing oral history is and how valuable it's recording. The nostalgia in some of these passages, I think I attribute to the myth-making kind, the type of nostalgia that people, because we are all too human, need in order to, to justify something or gain back some sense of sanity, uh, with regard to individual suffering or the collective death toll that accompanied Russian history from Stalin's collectivization and the gulags to World War II and loss of life there to neighbors snitching against neighbor. The stories in, the, in these pages are just so ripe for discussion and one visual element that I found really interesting and pervasive throughout the text was this idea of dissident kitchens. And so there's this one quote that observes the Russian kitchen, the pitiful Khrushchevka kitchenette. By the way, a Khrushchevka was effectively uh, cheap and prefabricated concrete or brick apartment uh, blocks that I believe began being built in the 1950s during the leadership of Nikita Khrushchev, whose name they're after. And they were just abysmal apartments, very tiny, cramped, but they were effectively how many families back then gained their first ever private apartments because before that everything was communal and you'd have multi-family or you ha you'd have multiple families living in one small apartment so that's a little bit of backdrop but the quote continues the pitiful Khrushchevka kitchenette nine to twelve square meters if you're lucky and on the other side of a flimsy wall the toilet your typical soviet floor plan Onions sprouting in old mayonnaise jars on the windowsill and a potted aloe for fighting colds. For us, the kitchen is not just where we cook. It's a dining room, a guest room, an office, a soap box. A space for group therapy sessions. In the 19th century, all of Russian culture was concentrated on aristocratic estates. In the 20th century, it lived on in our kitchens. That's where Pistroika really took place. 1960s dissident life is the kitchen life. Like in this testimony, the crammed kitchens of the Soviets served as the central gathering committee of the Russian spirit for nearly every family back then, including my own. So my grandma, my grandparents' kitchen in Moscow, for instance, remains a visual remnant of that long gone time. And I, there were just so many intriguing elements uh, throughout this writing. I, I can't possibly go through each one of them, but I would love to leave you with this one over here. It reads, quote, This was socialism, but it was also just everyday life. Back then, we didn't talk about it very much. Now that the world has transformed irreversibly, everyone is suddenly interested in that old life of ours. Whatever it may have been like, it was our life. In writing, I'm piecing together the history of domestic interior socialism as it existed in a person's soul. I've always been drawn to this miniature expanse, one person, the individual. It's where everything really happens. And so with that said, I hope you enjoyed this video. I, if you have if you plan to read it, do let me know. If you have read it, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to discuss with you. And as always, my ears are open and attentive. If you want to connect and chat about anything, uh, just let me know. And if time and disposition allow, please go ahead and like and comment and subscribe to this channel. It means a lot. I've been reading 
uh, some of your comments and your heartwarming messages over the weeks. And my goodness, it's, it's so incredibly nice and uplifting. So thank you so much for that. And hope to chat next time.